So in this particular learning outcome uh, three that we are going to be covering today, <clears throat> it's all about today understanding you know the remit of the law, the acts, and the legislation. So from an accounting profession point of view, um, when we work within the actuarial or you know the accounting profession in general, when we look at different services you know which are related to finance or finance related profession, um, if we talk about the actuaries or you know the accounting side of things. What we need to be able to do today is basically understand how, uh, you know, the law takes its turn in terms of, you know, how the law can be applied, which is specifically the branch of law, which is criminal law, because it deals with theft, bribery, fraud. Uh, we look at corruption. Uh, we look yeah. at whistleblowing. So this, these side of things which are related to, you know, accounting scandals, misappropriation of fund, misrepresentation of statements, or, you know, for fraudulent, um, let's say, preparation of accounts, falsification of papers, uh, you know, Phoenix companies as we know about it. So the idea here is today to understand, uh, you know, from a prospect of learning outcome three, we are going to be looking at primarily understanding the, the say, for example, the body of law, which is criminal law, how it can affect businesses, what are the law and legislation that we need to be aware of, as you know, practicing accountants or people who are going to be dealing in, you know, actuaries essentially, which is basically looking at, uh, you know, any sort of any professional essentially who is working within the financial sector and is dealing with, you know, financial instruments or finances, monies, and typically people who are related and offer these services in this sector should be aware of some sort of law in terms of how improprieties or, you know, where to say no, where to say, uh, where to maintain a professional code of ethics in terms of workings, and obviously where to draw a line uh, when you're dealing with clients. So there are four uh, assessment criteria that we're going to be looking at in particular. So it talks about understanding the impact of criminal law on business and professional organizations. So we're going to be relating it to some of the Companies Act uh, that we've studied earlier, the Companies Act of 2006. We're going to look at the Bribery Act. We're going to also look at the uh, Money Laundering Act. We're going to look at the uh, Director's Discreditation Act, DCCA. So we are looking at a couple of acts and regulations today while covering some of the you know, assessment criteria. So the first one is going to be generic about understanding <clears throat> which side of law actually comes in from a point of view of um, you know, specifically this profession. The second part of that would be related to understanding what is malpractice, what is fraud, what is bribery, uh, what is money laundering. So we're looking at some of the key terms. And then we're going to be looking at, you know, as an accountant or as a profession, professional within this, uh, you know, sector, what are the various codes of ethics uh, that we need to be adhering to and we should be aware of when we are providing these services to our clients. And then in the end, we will study some of the acts which are specifically related to uh, you know, Computer Misuse Act, uh, it could be the Offenses Act uh, in terms of penalties which are applied, money laundering, and, you know, things which are related to data protection and how sometimes you would see that, you know, accountants would ask for a KYC file, which is the, uh, you know, key facts that they need to have on file if they represent you with HMRC or some of the other regulatory bodies, then they need to have an authorization in place making sure that, uh, you know, the key documentations are available as far as, you know, um, the clients that they deal with or file the accounts for. So these are the bits that we're going to be looking at covering today in Learning Outcome 3. And as always, you know, we've got a <clears throat> set of presentation slides that we are going to go through, which cover some of these assessment criteria and also the key terminology, you know, which is involved in, uh, you know, study of the Learning Outcome 3. So impact of criminal law on business and professional organizations. This is the indicative content that we're going to be looking at covering. And in um, in general, we are also going to be looking at the four key acts which absolutely, uh, you know, directly apply. And we should have knowledge about when we provide these services to our clients specifically in this sector. Four assessment criteria we are looking at, um, you know, as I mentioned, just briefly took you through. So we'll discuss them in a bit more detail as we go along. We'll start off with, uh, you know, a couple of things which are related to understanding uh, the basic terms in terms of how they are applied. So when we talk about ethics in general, um, you know, it's a, it's a generic term that we now get to see being used across most of the industry. So we talk about ethics primarily in IT, 
happen. We talk about professional code of ethics. We talk about ethics in the accounting profession, wherein obviously different bodies have drawn up different codes of professional ethics for accountants or you know people dealing with actuaries within this profession. So there are different codes, but different bodies like AAT, ACCA, IFA, they have their own codes, but pretty much they follow what are called the IFRS guidelines in the background. So there might be some cosmetic differences here and there, but generally most of them, you know, would prescribe pretty much the same code of ethics and professional conduct which are required, you know, when when we offer services uh, in this particular sector as an as an accountant, as a financial accountant, as a management accountant, things like that. So when we look at ethics in general, um, you know, we are looking at basically set of morals or some sort of guidelines which actually inform us in terms of what behavior, how do we need to conduct ourselves. And the idea of having the guidelines is primarily to differentiate between right and wrong. So as long as these guidelines act as some sort of, a, let's say, um, sets of rule, which tell us very clearly that this is something which is permissible, this is something which is not permissible, those are the ones that we need to be able to understand. And at some stage, although these are not, uh, you know, let's put it this way, enforceable by law that everybody has to follow these guidelines, but generally speaking, as we see people offering these services through a company or through, uh, as your client network increases, you would generally see that these these ethics and codes of practices would then be incorporated into your day-to-day -day policies and procedures and how you deal with clients. Now, one of the other things that we also need to look at broadly is that from an accountancy profession point of view, uh, you know, at some stage when you work, uh, there is some part of the work which is done, is, which is done in the case of, uh, you know, um, say, let's say, providing statements or publishing accounts, which are basically preparation of accounts at some stage which are published on the company's house. So these, uh, you know, when, when we do, um, um, let me rephrase and I'll give you an example, which I think all of us will be able to relate to. When you sometimes see that when we have to get, you know, some sort of attestation done, there are certain professions in which, you know, certain professionals are allowed to do some attestation on certain public documents. So when we look at doctors, when we look at lawyers, we look at accountants, we look at teachers. So there are these professions in which you have that ability to be able to attest the legal document. So sometimes if somebody is filling in a passport application or making a bank account, opening a bank account application, if they ask for two references, normally what will happen is you will always end up going to an accountant or, you know, if you know somebody in your circle who offers these services, then you will probably go back and, you know, uh, request for a, uh, let, let's say a reference or a character reference or, you know, a reference related to your documentation. And the reasons why this has been done is because some of these professions have what are called the code of conduct. So there is some sort of a body, um, which is in this case IFRS, which basically dis prescribes these code of conducts. And then various bodies and uh, you know, associations which have been formed over the years, they basically look at maintaining, upholding, and also implementing, and in some cases, monitoring whether these codes of conducts are essentially followed or not. So when we look at in general about you know why these code of conducts are required is because when we look at the accountancy profession, what we are basically seeing is that sometimes after developing or having some of these skills, what we need to be able to do is provide and use these skills to be able to, uh, you know, come up with, uh, let's say, documentation or statements which are published at some place, some point in time on the company's house or in various, uh, you know, different bodies. So when we look at preparation of accounts, financial statements, they have to be prepared in such a way that they are done professionally, they are adhering to a certain practice which has been or a code of conduct or a practice which has been defined and they are meeting some relevant guidelines so when we talk about the you know IES codes which are prescribed so IES 7 code which is primarily for the preparation of financial statements this is where all of this you know seems to culminate so you see the code of ethics you see the law and act and legislations you see the code of professional ethics and last but not the least, all this is being delivered through somebody as a person. And in this case, this person or this particular agency or this particular outlet which provides these services tends to be what is called the accountancy profession. So when we look at, um, you know, all this being applicable and how it seems to work in a seamless relationship between what is law 
what we what we look at is as from a point of view of different uh, you know acts which are there from the uh, fr- which have become laws over the years from the passing of the act in the parliament and then finally how these acts rules and regulations are used by different bodies uh, in in this profession to be able to create what is called the code of conduct or ethical behavior guidelines and then they are broadly observed by all people working within this profession to ensure that they provide services at the highest possible level uh, in terms of you know in in terms of professionalism and also in terms of making sure that they are adhering to what is called the uh, ethical code and the code of conduct so when we look at this particular profession when i say accountancy profession we have three different uh, you know ways through which we can look at you have the skills which is you know when you acquire a qualification whether it's ACCA, whether it's IAT, whether it's IC, ICAW, EAW, whether it's IFA Direct, these are bodies which will obviously allow you to gain the skills. And then when we look at the adherence of common code of values and conduct, these are bodies which basically create these ethics and these code of conduct, and they tend to be generally in the UK, the IFRS. You also look at other bodies like AAT, ACCA, and IFA, and some of the others which actually adapt this code customize it, and then obviously, uh, you know, cosmetically might be slightly different, but they pretty much have the same core in the background. And then because they are enforced and because they are created by a body, which is uh, a non-regulatory body or a body which basically looks at, you know, when you look at the FRC, Financial Reporting Council, that body has the responsibility to be able to ensure that these code of conducts are, these standards are created and then these standards which are created are duly acceptable in the society and they help in the delivery of these uh, you know services in a very professional manner and that is where you see the culmination of all the three different bodies which are required but they are doing their own work in their own silos but at the same time uh, when we look at the overall aspect of what these help us to achieve they help us to achieve what is called the uh, you know, the code of conduct or some sort of a professional ethic, which is then, uh, you know, discharged by uh, people working within this, uh, you know, profession. And if you look at, you know, um, <clears throat> body of skills and theory, wherein you basically acquire the knowledge. So in this case, you could uh, look at some bodies have examinations, some have assessment, some also look at, you know, continuous professional development. But the whole idea is that at some stage, they all uh, have to basically culminate in terms of ensuring the relationship between these three skills that you acquire by completing an academic qualification. You look at adhering to certain uh, and having knowledge of certain laws and acts which are required to be adhered when you are discharging your responsibilities in the profession. And then the neutral body, which ensures that these standards are generally acceptable in the society. They They have a common framework and they are generally applicable without any, uh, you know, say, difficulties um, from a point of view, uh, people applying it in the profession uh, tend to be, you know, all coming together in terms of some sort of a, um, let's say, relationship, which allows this to seamlessly work as as, as a, say, for example, as a service. Now, broadly speaking, if we look at, um, you know, go into a bit more details, when we look at ethics and ethical behavior, what we're looking at is that at some stage, even if you're not in this profession and if you look at generally oh uh, you know another professions if you look at banking for example you look at um, you know a legal profession or services in general you would generally see that you know there are lots of laws and regulations which apply and the reason why these laws and regulations are created is that they are basically going to be guides or you know uh, available as guidelines to be able to look at conflicts issues and problems when they arise so it's like a standard uh, you know, it's like a standard book through which if there are problems which arise and if there are solutions which need to be found, these laws, these legislations form these guidelines to be able to then help us resolve, you know, some of these issues ethically. That means amicably this could be done, uh, you know, if they are not obviously uh, resolved amicably, then obviously in some cases we will have to resort to, uh, you know, the uh, the court of law. And in some cases, these matters are then settled in the court of law. And that is where the discharge of the duties and responsibilities by different individuals who have the responsibility to be able to then make those judgments and decisions 
have to do it ethically and you know have to show when they when they perform their duties and they're observing the regulations which have been set then it tends to be showing ethical behavior now when we when, um, when we look at say for example uh, in some cases what and why they have to be applied these are the four or five uh, you know uh, broad guidelines that we need to look at so they have been put in place as guidelines because they help us avoid, avoid conflicts they allow us to act as per objectives and in the interest of uh, you know uh, in in the act of public interest and we'll cover that what i mean by public interest in a subsequent slide later they help us understand very clearly what information can be divulged what information has to be disclosed or what information has to be kept confidential in some cases it also tells us when i talk about the code of uh, practice code of conduct professional ethics it you know clearly informs us what is right what is wrong and then in what places we need to be honest straightforward and transparent when obviously we look at preparing statements or you know statements which are going to be uh, portraying say for example a financial condition of a company or you know providing accounts of a company or an organization or a business and then when we talk about the body of uh, skills and theory part of it it helps us also to maintain professional knowledge so in some cases when these um, you know guidelines and regulations are updated as a person or as a uh, as a member if you are a part of any professional associations within this particular sector then what most of these professional bodies uh, expect of you if you are in the profession is to keep yourself up to date and keep your knowledge up to date as far as providing these services and that is where the uh, you know the importance of the career professional development or training and development actually comes in and that is what allows you to update yourself periodically so that you are able to you know maintain that professional code of conduct which allows you to follow the guidelines which is ethics and then show the behavior which is required within the profession and that would be you know termed as ethical behavior now <clears throat> there are certain typical uh, you know ethical principles which have to be adhered to when we work within this profession so when we look at the five fundamental principles of uh, you know accounting profession when they relate them to ethics in particular these tend to be these five which are you know listed on and you can see on the slide so they tend to be integrity objectivity professional confidence uh, confidentiality and professional behavior now these five principles are fundamental to somebody working within this profession as an accountant or you know in in any form of uh, such profession which is basically actuarial in the nature that you are dealing with financial information or you know the uh, consequences of risk of a uh, dealing uh, you know in handling financial information for a client customer business organization or you know um, you know any form of legal ownership of business now this framework and these fundamental principles have not just emerged overnight they have been work in progress there are changes which keep happening and obviously at some stage when we understand how they came about and why some of these things have come about and have become a part and parcel of you know when we look at um, uh, working within this profession is that at some stage there have been uh, you know if you look at the early 70s when standardization was typically happening in this profession when we look at the different types of accounting systems which are followed here and across the atlantic or in elsewhere in other countries you generally see that there has to be some sort of a framework which puts this all into one particular uh, you know uh, on a single say platform or one particular plane and that is where we look at when you know the the concept of this framework was created and this concept of framework was primarily created to ensure that uh, you know when we look at accounting standards when we look at these code of professional ethics they will be standard all across whether they are observed in 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 countries like like the UK or Europe across the atlantic in the us and elsewhere in asia and they tend to be you know the basic guidelines in terms of how some of these principle approaches have come up so when we look at principles and when we look at rules they form the conceptual framework of how the accounting profession and the code of ethics are written and observed and they tend to be you know um, over the years uh, they have evolved and obviously some sort of this framework which has come into play which most 
say companies follow. So if you look at the big four, the uh, big four accounting firms, which are PwC, Ernst & Young, you look at Accenture, uh, when you look at these big uh, three or four firms, they also look at, uh, you know, having these, because they are large firms, so the idea is they have their own, you know, obviously policies and procedures in place, but when we, when they deal on behalf of clients, when they deal and represent on behalf of clients, they have to ensure that not just the code of ethics are adhered to, but they also understand the law and legislation which needs to be adhered to in a particular geography or a country. And last but not the least, when they produce the statement or the accounts, uh, which are then published on, you know, different, uh, you know, let's say, um, um, requiring different frameworks, and then they are published in a particular domain, then they are typically corresponding to such guidelines which are applicable in that country or as per the law in that country. So when we look at the formation of these fundamental ethical principles, and we look at the uh, the way this conceptual framework has come about, it was and it is an approach which has been adopted over the years uh, by different bodies. And what the approach has uh, taken as a route has been that one of the base bits is to look at uh, principles which are standardized across all different standards or, di or different bodies. And then the set of rules which they have created over the years also comply and, you know, uh, correspond to providing a very clear picture of what the uh, statements or accounts or, you know, uh, let's say documentation which is produced at the end of the, uh, you know, financial year. So when we look at the um, uh, the base of this particular, um, you know, uh, the where the ethics come from or the fundamental principles, uh, you know, uh, of ethical um, principles come about in this profession, we basically look at the principles approach and the rules approach. And the principle approach is something which has been defined in the book, uh, which basically caters to the law and legislation which is present in a country. But the rules side of things tend to be when interpretation of this happens and there are no standard solutions or guidelines which are available to resolve or, you know, look at certain cases or on, on uh, or certain problems or issues which arise. So in those cases, rules are then applicable and these rules uh, are basically, they, they come up, they actually come about or they actually get created on a case by case basis when some of these, uh, you know, issues, problems actually land up in the court of law. So in those cases, when judgments are passed by uh, by courts and they make an exception or when they interpret these principles which have been applied, then in those cases, it leads to the creation of rules. And that rules approach then also gets incorporated at some point in time as a standard reference. So if there is a similar case which is to come to trial and there is a, 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 a judgment which has been passed at some point in time, uh, in order to resolve that issue or problem or, you know, uh, conflicts between two parties, then those rules become sets of references which can, which are basically easier to enforce. They can be quickly uh, referenced to. And in some cases, you know, they help us look at the loopholes which are essentially, you know, um, uh, not clearly identifiable when we look at the principles approach. So sometimes when acts are written, you would see amendments happen over a, over the point in time or over the years. So you look at the Health and Safety Act of 1974, just as an example, uh, the HUSWA, as we call it, in 1974 when it came about. But it has undergone a lot of iterations over the years. You look at the Data Protection Act of 1998, which is something that we are going to refer to today, and that has undergone a lot of iterations over the years. So today that revised act of data protection or, you know, with the GDPR guidelines, uh, general data protection regulation guidelines uh, is now updated for the 2016 or 2018. So when we say Data Protection Act, the original act was introduced in 1998, but with the exceptions, with the uh, amendments which have happened over the years, the uh, up-to-date, you know, uh, up-to-date act is referred to as the Data Protection Act of, say, 2018. So similarly, rules allow these judgments to be passed or for these, uh, let's say, uh, areas which are gap areas to be identified. And sometimes when these judgments are passed, then it takes a rule-based approach because they then become references for the future and they allow similar cases or problems to be resolved uh, when it comes to the court of law. Now, in particular, when we talk about the uh, accountancy profession and when we talk about accounting in general, 
obviously there are different sorts of laws which can be uh, applicable within this profession but generally speaking the compliances that we need to be able to ensure are primarily going to be related to criminal law because here uh, when we say criminal law is because of the fact that uh, these will relate to either uh, you know some sort of proceedings which will be uh, dealing with financial uh, theft it could be dealing with uh, you know misappropriation it could be dealing with misrepresentation so the, the side of law and some of the acts that we see typically are related so for example if identity theft it is involved or maybe um, uh, use of the name of a company is involved in terms of doing the transactions as a third party now all these will lead to some sort of financial consequence that means there will be some sort of a loss or some sort of a monetary loss which will be applicable and that is where we will look at you know the side of what is called the criminal law so in general when we talk about uh, the this particular profession we going to be relating to criminal law which is a body that relates to crime and it basically is uh, you know important is because it prescribes to what is going to be seen as threatening harmful or otherwise endangering some sort of property or you know pro um, let's say assets which are going to have some financial worth and that is what is going to be represented uh, you know from our from our point of view so two categories of law generally when we see civil and criminal law but most of it which is going to be applicable to us when we want to understand the law and regulations which must be complied with within the accounting side of profession or actuaries in particular we will see uh, you know criminal law being applicable in this particular context and again just going back to when we look at the code of ethics and you know the um, code of professional ethics ethical behavior and the you know the uh, let's say the uh, uh, let's say the rules and guidelines which are implemented or you know uh, created within this particular site are done by you know these four bodies so you look at the international federation of accountants ifac now that's a body which basically looks at developing all the uh, standards which are related to uh, you know people working within this profession worldwide and these standards uh, typically include the professional code of ethics it also includes uh, you know the ethical behavior guidelines and also the ifac's international ethical standard boards for accountant if you are a member of that body or if you uh, look at taking membership there are some bodies obviously which deliver you know the theory and skills related and they are members of this particular body and in those cases what they have to look at is adapt, adapting their standards which have been created and then create their standards from a point of view of uh, you know going forward and then you have the second body which is the consultative committee of accounting bodies this is primarily a body which is related to uh, you know aat and it is it has some different memberships and out of which you know when we look at uh, they coming out with a code of conduct you will generally see aat has their own code of conduct uh, you know for professional accounting and accountants and that is what they would uh, you know be looking at and the other part of it what we deal with and see that most of the people in this profession would deal with hmrc so either you're dealing as an agent or as a representative of a company or you're dealing uh, with hmrc directly because you have an agency or a business or a client number of clients and you deal on their behalf so obviously this is a department which obviously we are quite well aware of and familiar with wherein we look at filing of vat you know taxes self assessment you know lots of other side of operations which are done through uh, you know accountancy side and we deal with this particular body the other body that we look at which was created i think somewhere in the early 2000s was the national crime agency and nca as we call it this is a body which is basically look the remit of this body and role, roles and responsible of responsibilities of this body is primarily to look at tackling serious crime or serious organized crime which are primarily related to you know drug trafficking human trafficking in but also has a very key role in dealing with fraud and money laundering so we will look at one of the acts which we will study and that will be under the aspect of what is called the money laundering uh, you know um, uh, pretext of it and in terms when we look at uh, you know what are the um, you know circumstances under which a fraud is uh, committed bribery uh, when we talk about bribery and bribes in general what are the consequences of that fraud uh, and you know when we look at uh, 
in some cases obviously it can lead to fines heavy fines and also uh, you know imprisonment and we will understand that in the subsequent slide so the nca or the national crime agency looks at a couple of important aspects but the one that we are going to be dealing with and focused on would be related to fraud and money laundering in particular now, some of the other slides that I've got in this presentation are pretty much dwelling deeper into what are business ethics and professional values, which we have talked about when we talk about these five fundamental ethical principles. So what I've done then after that is basically, you know, looked at a few more slides to dwell deeper into some of these ethical principles that we need to be just aware of theoretically here at this point in time so that you know that when we talk about the code of conduct in the accounting profession, what are these five principles which come into play and you know how they have to be looked at when you you know deal with clients, prepare accounts, do bookkeeping or you know some of the associated functions in this profession and how some of these would be then put into you know practice. Now when we talk about um, another aspect of um, a, you know say for example the um, code of ethics one of the other things which generally comes across is a concept called triple bottom line now this concept of triple bottom line uh, you know i don't know in terms of if you've heard about or not but this was something which was proposed by an english uh, consultant who was working you know with, doing some consultation with some american companies and is now represented under what is called the Brundtland Report. So when he basically proposed um, that, you know, uh, companies, when they look at, obviously all companies, organizations, businesses are set up with one of the primary aims is to make profits, profits for the shareholders, profits for the you know, owners, employees, directors of the company. Uh, but apart from that, what he said was he diversified this in 2008 uh, when we basically mentioned that the company should also look at uh, what is called their, um, uh, you know, delivery and discharge of their duties and responsibilities towards the planet and also to the people who were, serve or work, you know, or are a part of a larger community uh, where the business actually derives its resources from or, you know, benefits from in terms of utilization of the wider environmental resources. So the triple bottom line concept basically it was then defined as an accounting framework which takes into account three aspects of what the company's functions are. They tend to be social, environmental, and also financial. So when we talk about the triple bottom line, sometimes they're referred to as the three Ps. So you have people, profit, and planet. But in general, when we relate people, profit, and planet uh, to three different parts of the functions of a business or an organization or a business, you would generally see that they correspond to what is called the social aspect of it. So what is uh, the businesses, uh, as a business, what is it contributing back to the society? You look at the environmental aspect of it in terms of whether the business is using ethical practices, sustainability, recycling. You know, you look at, say, for example, water conservation, carbon footprint. You know, those kind of concepts which have started to come in under uh, under this remit tend to be environmental or ecological. And then the financial side, which basically tend to be that is the company making it profits. Uh, or ethical profits sometimes as we use the word, is the company then looking at uh, making uh, excessive profits or, you know, in some cases when you see examples which come up in the news wherein we talk about, uh, you know, companies uh, outsourcing operations to, you know, uh, for cheaper, uh, let's say, manpower and labor to countries in the uh, Asian subcontinent where, or Asian continent in particular, when you look at, you know, uh, conditions not being met, wages, minimum wages not being met, conditions in terms of their factories and other things being, you know, poor in terms of safety standards. So in those cases, the responsibility of the organization towards community and people in general, which work for the company uh, or help the company in deriving profits, you know, has to be looked at. So this concept of, uh, you know, sustainability and uh, the concept of corporate social responsibility has a slightly wider remit. And when we look at this from an understanding of, from a point of view of accountants, you know, uh, again, there is a term which will come across, which we will get to here and cover that in subsequent slide is that accountants have a responsibility to act in public interest. That means they would need to look at the the concept of triple bottom line specifically from an accounting framework point of view because this has now become an acceptable globally acceptable framework and that allows the company's uh, you know uh, functions and responsibilities to be 
uh, you know, defined widely into or say into broadly into three different aspects of what we generally see is people, profit and planet or social, environmental and financial. So this is something that we need to be aware of. Again, theoretically, it's not something which is enforceable uh, in the court of law, but generally speaking, as good practice or as best practice, a lot of accountancy firms, when we talk about the big four, they look at when you look at picking out the annual general reports or some of the statements of the companies uh, which are prepared by the big four or even you know by ourselves, we generally see, depending on the size and scale of the operation of the business, you would generally see at some stage, you know, corporate social responsibility or ethics side of things start to creep in as one of the key bits which, uh, you know, are also published in the uh, financial statements as notes or as some sort of footnotes which are provided, you know, to say that the company is, uh, you know, pa partnered with a charity or his company is doing this particular, uh, you know, bit for the, uh, le let's say, the community. Or in some cases, you would see companies associating with charitable causes. And that is where you also see that why in this profession, uh, if you do some charity or if there are some part of the income of the company going into charitable causes, then some part of that is totally exempt from tax. And that is where this part of, you know, the understanding needs to be there that, yes, there is a, a, a wider remit under which sustainability or, you know, CSR side of things need to be looked into. And specifically, when we look at the triple bottom line concept, this is uh, an accounting framework, which obviously, you know, is now globally acceptable. And in some cases, large companies, you know, would basically look at adopting this to ensure that they, this is used in the evaluation of their performance uh, in the broader perspective to create greater business value. So as accountants, we need to be aware of this and it is something that we can offer uh, to businesses or, you know, services to businesses depending on the size and scale of business or the, you know, the operation that we are dealing with. Now, when we talk about this particular concept and we look at risk, corporate governance, uh, you know, it tends to be uh, also related to you know, the code of practice and, uh, you know, minimum guidelines that we need to follow through when we look at registration of companies with companies house and when we look at the memorandum of articles, association or articles of association, the two other documents which are normally required for the formation of a company, you would see that in those documents, uh, you know, guidelines are provided for the governance, risk and ethics in particular for the directors and the shareholders of the organization. So if you end up using that standard 40 page document today, and if you do not upload anything on from your side, when you fill in the IN01 form, you know, for the registration of a new company, and if a company is not, you know, obviously looking at their own articles of association or memorandum of under, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding, then the company's house, when you form a company, if you've done an application recently, or in the last, you know, I would say 10 years, you would generally see that there's a standard document which can, comes across and that standard document that you get uh, in the form of these two MOA and, um, you know, articles of association, AOA, tend to be essentially the guidelines related to what is for uh, governance in terms of guidelines for the or roles and responsibilities which are real specifically related to the directors of the company. What could be the risk and what are the ethical guidelines or the compliance that the companies need to adhere to? when they are formed. So, for example, the submission of AR03 form, when we talk about, you know, the company is an ongoing concern, and obviously you need to file that every year with the company's house, uh, the submission of accounts at the end of the financial year, and submission of that to, you know, company's house in Cardiff. So those are some of the guidelines that we look at when we talk about these uh, ethical codes of practices, when we talk about governance, we talk about the acts and legislation that we need to be aware of. And that is all what needs to be covered in the first, uh, you know, assessment criteria, which is uh, 3.1. So any questions on this so far? Uh, no. Yeah. Right, so any questions? Go on. Uh, sorry, go on. Any, any questions, Andy, go on. No, it's all good. All right, okay, all good. So let's look at uh, the second assessment criteria, which is now looking at uh, you know, explaining the elements and consequence of what is malpractice, what is fraud, what is bribery, and how do we relate this to, you know, this side of the things when we talk about accountancy as a profession. Now, broadly looking at the terms and the definitions first, just to understand. Now, 
when we talk about corruption you know corruption is basically uh, defined as any illegitimate use of office when you have power or for example if you're using the office there is one such thing which is going around now in the news if you have seen obviously apart from uh, the passing away of prince philip which has happened yesterday but if you look at the news in general for the last four days which is there is a particular thing which is making some headlines which is the exchange of text messages between our former prime minister david cameron and rishi sunak who's the current chancellor of the exchequer so there were uh, there are questions which are being raised for the illegitimate use of office when uh, mr greensill had been given a business card and you know some uh, you know access to the white hall in particular when david cameron was the prime minister and later on david cameron has has worked for this company which was which is now gone bust and it had uh, david cameron as an employee of that company or as an advisor to that firm has actually texted the chancellor to basically look at you know business loans or bounce back loans for this company and this company has now gone into administration or has collapsed so when we talk about corruption uh, in general i'm not hinting that uh, obviously david cameron has been cleared of uh, you know of any any such misconduct or charges by the parliamentary committee but just looking at giving an example at this stage is that when we talk about corruption it could be the illegitimate use of an office or a power that you have so obviously the opposition here labor and some of the other parties are saying that okay rishi sunak has made some of these texts uh, public david cameron should come back, uh, make those public as well and obviously mr greensell who who set up this firm uh, you know hasn't spoken so far so what they are interested in also finding out is that there are there needs to be tighter regulations around this uh, use of public office which does not leave any scope for any corruption or misuse because in some of the texts it is clearly said the rishi says okay i will be pushing uh, the department to you know speed up the process so which is basically using the power of your office uh you know to do or uh, gain illegitimate uh, you know say interest or uh, you know favors now when we talk about bribery bribery is not limited to giving or accepting payments bribery can be done is basically a uh, you know let's say when when we talk about what is bribery bribery is a larger concept when we when we refer to bribery in the sense that it is an act through which you know essentially you can provide uh different uh you know when i say to provide is in terms of its literal definition it could be offering it could be promising it could be giving it could be accepting or soliciting some sort of an advantage that uh, you know you could gain and that would all be termed illegal unethical or maybe in some cases cause a breach of trust because that will allow one party to gain unfair advantage over the other so bribery is something which has been recognized in the uk uh, you know financial system and also in the legal profession and when we talk about the bribery act you know which we are going to do in the subsequent uh, you know slides the act of 2010 basically uh, you know defines this very clearly that if there are uh, ways through which you can offer accept uh, or you know basically in some cases uh, you know benefit Uh, one person or one party over the other party on on behalf of the other party and that leads to you getting an unfair advantage would all be termed under something called bribery so when we talk about corruption when we talk about bribery we need to understand that these are uh, you know say for example general terms which are going to be in use specifically when we deal with uh, you know financial or financial instrument statements and things like that now there is something also which is called negligence now sometimes what happens is we say that i've committed this uh, on 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 the you know we we claim that we have done this as an offense or this has happened uh, under negligence so for example sometimes a, a different example which i'll give you is that you end up parking on double yellow lines and you end up receiving a fine now if you knew that these are double yellow lines and parking or you know is is uh, you know on this particular uh side of the road you're not allowed to you know stand or you know obviously be stationary and if it has been done on the basis of negligence of you not knowing the law or in some cases you doing it on purpose but claiming negligence would be that you are trying to act or basically say that i wasn't aware of this particular crime which has been committed and for which i have been fined but 
this is then being claimed that you are being negligent. That means you are not aware of the law and legislation in that place. So sometimes you would see that in our profession, when accounts are created or when financial statements are created, or for example, certain references or uh, you know, let's say documentation is done, wherein we claim that this has been done on behalf of uh, on this has been done primarily for the client, but you weren't aware of the full circumstances of what this was required or why it was required and this has led to this result or this particular loss or this particular you know overlooking of the act or legislation, then in those cases, you are going to be looking at what is called a breach of duty. And that breach of duty is going to be done on the basis of or classified as a breach of duty on the basis of what is called negligence. So in some cases, this could lead to a loss. This could also lead to a crime. This could also lead to, say, for example, fines or imprisonment. But this is one of the clear things that we need to understand is that sometimes if you're not aware, as we also say, half knowledge is you know dangerous. Sometimes you would see that if there are things which are not applicable, you don't understand and you're not able to understand the consequences of that particular side of actions, then in those cases, you know, we should stay away from actually doing that. And that side of uh, crime or that side of misconduct or let's say malpractice, which happens because of the lack of knowledge of the regulation or it happens when you are aware of it, but you are claiming to be, uh, you know, that uh, we are not aware of it. It will all still fall under negligence, and this is also considered, you know, under criminal law. And in this case, the law of tort essentially negligence comes from the law of tort essentially. But this is also, try, uh, you know, um, covered under the proceedings in the court of law. So when we define negligence. You know, um, I hope I've been able to explain that. But if I look at the textbook definition of what you see on the slide, it, it is defined as any act or omission which falls short of standards to be expected of a reasonable man. That means if you're trying to make a claim to succeed um, and you do you have the necessary facts to be able to establish that for your client, then in that case, you you are, you know, not in, say, for example, breach of duty, but if you do not have the full facts and you still go ahead and establish those as facts, then you are going to be considered that you are in breach of duty. And in this case, the other party, which basically ends up losing, for example, this could be related to financial loss. Then in those cases, the other party is then liable to bring across a claim against you or your firm or on behalf of your client and your firm. And that will be considered in the court of law under what is called negligence. And negligence falls under the law of thought. The third term that we need to understand to understand this assessment criteria is what is fraud? Now, obviously, fraud is a wider definition and it's a very broad definition in terms of what is fraud. What we don't want to do is basically talk about fraud in general. There could be different types of frauds and, you know, we, we are not concerned about fraud in general. So fraud would be anything which is wrongful doing, which is uh, which is a act that you've done, which is primarily motivated by creating a deceit or, you know, you have some sort of an intention to create deceit uh, for either financial gain uh, or, you know, personal gain that would be classed as fraud. But when we talk about different types of frauds and we talk about, you know, um, there are obviously loads of different types of frauds. You know, we, we get to hear them and I've given some examples here. Things like identity theft is something which the National Crime Agency, you know, regularly advertises about. There are lots of campaigns they run. Theft in terms of national insurance, which has happened, or my documents and my identity. You know, credit card theft that we get to see from banks. Uh, you know, banks have to then keep losing money every year. Banks actually lose uh, in excess of 480 million pounds every year just on credit card theft. So there are different types of thefts and frauds which can essentially happen and they are all classified. When I say theft, uh, different types of, you know, deceits which are primarily related to gaining uh, from, uh, gaining from it in terms of financial means would be all, uh, you know, coined under what is called fraud. But what we are more concerned about is what is financial fraud. So financial fraud is when you are basically looking at, you know, um, uh, providing uh, let's say wrong information, which could lead to, uh, let's say your client or individuals actually gaining financially from, uh, you know, that transaction or the, you know, documentation or whatever it is. So when we talk about, say, 
financial fraud, we are looking at, you know, straight away it should click in your mind, we are talking about financial products. A simple, a simple example of this I would give you is, if you work within the company and you work within merchant banking side of things and the company is looking at a flotation or the company's share price and you have a lot of shares and you are dealing on behalf of the uh, company and you maintain, say, for example, share holdings for a number of uh, shareholders, and you know that the company is going to come out with some uh, profit earnings or you know declarations of the profit earnings for this quarter and they're not looking good this will impact the cost or not the cost the share price of the uh, you know the share prices on the stock exchange and because you are privy to that information you decide to offload some part of your stocks at the uh, at the exchange uh, by selling them off the shares and in return, you know, because you're privy to such information, and that would be termed as what is called financial fraud. So any sort of information which could be used to gain financially uh, and create a situation for your client wherein you're able to benefit them financially would be termed as what is called financial fraud. So it could be used or carried out on on behalf of the agency, the accountant, the third party, which represents the client, uh, and it could be carried out for individuals under their own name or in somebody else's name. But as long as it is, uh, you know, helping you or helping your clients gain financial money or financial, uh, let's say, gain financially, that would be all termed as is called financial fraud. Now, the last term that we want to look at before we get into the assessment criteria is what is corruption? Now, again, there is a generic broad definition of corruption. So corruption could be, you know, bribery could come under corruption. One of the things through which corruption happens is bribery. So in some countries, you look at sometimes you have to, you know, uh, give uh, money to get work done. And that, in some cases, is a plain statement that, you know, we paid a fees. No, that is not fees. If you're basically looking at paying fees, which is over and above, you know, what is required for the department to do their work or the official to do their work and is seen as a bit of a um, speaker, then that would be termed as what is called, you know, bribery. So there are different forms of corruption and corruption has different, you know, types if I have to define it. The main forms of corruption would be when you're basically trying to bribe an individual uh, or an agency embezzlement in terms of money, uh, you look at fraud and extortion, there are going to be all different forms of uh, corruption which can which can be done or seen primarily working within this uh, sector or in any other sector as well. Now, a simple definition of, you know, where would we differentiate, um, you know, say for example, let's put it this way, um, and give an example of corruption would be when we look at sometimes inexcessive hospitality, that means you know, you have an inspection which is happening, and in that inspection, you're expected to provide a certain thing, certain amount of documentation or information which has been already seek, priorly agreed before the inspection starts would be normal routine and normal procedure. But during the course of the inspection, if you're offering excessive hospitality to the inspectors, or if you're seen to offer, you know, um, say some sort of benefit or uh, let's say, business or promotional expenses. When we look at, uh, you know, as accountants, when, when we deal with practical side of things is, sometimes you see your clients sending across receipts of dinners or, you know, gifts which have been given to clients and they are trying to claim it off as a business expense. So some of these things which are then not allowed, say for example, you would end up providing some sort of, uh, you know, free take care of your clients or, you know, um, your clients offering free tickets to their customers, you know, to certain events, like, for example, uh, events like, you know, it could be a music event, it could be, you know, some sort of an event that you've offered tickets for dinner, for example, gifts, expensive gifts. Now, most companies have some sort of policies wherein if you're happy with the service and you want to reward an employee, normally the there is a bit of a restriction to the amount of gift or generosity that you can show towards the services which have been offered. And they tend to be, depending on the companies, you know, they tend to be limited to about 50 pounds, generally what I see, give or take, you know, within the UK context. But if it is to exceed and you're going to give a gift which is going to be more than what has been defined in the corporate policy or the company policy of that company, then that would be seen as some sort of bribery or some sort of, uh, you know, 
um, uh, let's say, untowards hospitality or excessive hospitality, which is being shown towards the services that you're receiving from that client. So corruption is something which, uh, you know, knowingly or unknowingly takes different forms. It could be in the form of bribery, excessive hospitality, embezzlement. It could be in the form of fraud or extortion. And this tends to be, you know, something that is closely related to this profession. Now, in certain countries, when we talk about U.S. in particular, there are things like what is called facilitation payments. So if uh, if we look at, you know, Europe, Western Europe in general, this is clearly defined as a form of corruption. So if you're giving excessive payments or additional payments which are being done to induce the officials to perform a particular function quickly or, you know, helping you jump the queue or move the file or, you know, some sort of uh, documentation which is required to be done and it you know, basically is done on a way wherein you're given preferential treatment over the others. And if these additional payments are done towards that, then they are seen as, you know, a form of act of bribery. Now, in U.S. and in some other countries, the facilitation payments. So in this case, an example would be that if a company or a client of yours is dealing in import exports and they normally give some facilitation payments to the custom officials to clear their shipments quicker than some of the other shipments which are which are at the port then this would be clearly seen as a form of bribery given to the customs official but in certain countries like the US and in some asian countries obviously these facilitation payments are not considered bribery and there, there's a very you know thin line differentiating this from bribery in those uh, you know in those countries so sometimes um, when you look at these payments being made, you would generally see that the amount of money or the amount of payments uh, being made, you know, are treated as facilitation payments and they are not considered as what are called outright bribes. So there is a slight bit of differentiation in terms of how this law acts out in different countries across the globe. But generally speaking, when we talk about Europe, and we talk about Western Europe in particular, if payments are done to expedite, uh, you know, uh, certain processes or certain side of things, then these payments described as what are called facilitation payments would be still considered as what are called acts of bribery. Now, how does corruption, bribery, you know, malpractice, and negligence relate to the accounting profession. That is what we need to understand in this particular learning outcome. So when we say 3.2 and we talk about, you know, the elements and consequences of malpractice, fraud, bribery in business organizations, what we need to be able to do is relate this, contextualize this to our accounting profession. So when we look at, um, you know, the accounting profession and how they are brought into context, we look at one particular body, which is called the FRC, Financial Reporting Council, and this particular body is basically responsible for creating all the codes of ethic, ethical standards and practices which are to be followed by people who are within this profession. So this body, Financial Reporting Council, actually monitors, inflows, enforces compliance with these regulations and standards which have been created as acts, legislations, and they, if they are not complied with, if, they are, if there is non-conformance, uh, you know, uh, on it by people working within this profession, which is either accountants or actuarial uh, professions, then you would generally see that disciplinary action would, would follow. So in our case, when we need to look at the remit and context of how this relates to the profession, that is what will be applicable to us, and this will be related to what is the uh, compliance and implementation of this, uh, these laws, legislation, which are basically ethical codes of practices, ethical practices and code of conduct, and enforced by the Financial Reporting, uh, you know, Council FRC. Now, if we have to look at just from a interest point of view, theoretical point of view, what are the approaches which we need to adopt when we are in working within this profession? So there are two approaches. One is a reactive approach. The other is a proactive approach. So when we talk about a reactive approach, what we are looking at doing is we are basically waiting for the things to take its own uh, turn or the consequences of the things actually happening. And then after that, we are going to do is basically go in and, you know, do a stitch up or try and, you know, obviously look at, you know, solving the situation or what has caused the problem and try and resolve it. On the proactive side, what you're looking at doing is you know that there is a problem which could occur. 
So you're identifying it proactively in the interest of what is called in the remit of what is called the public trust, which we are coming to. And what you're doing is using the best practices, the core ethics, uh, which have been defined in, in this particular, and you're using them to be able to, uh, you know, resolve that problem even before it occurs. So a simple example, when we look at a reactive approach, is a very popular case in point of Enron, when we talk about. I know here the big four, the accounting firm action chair, essentially, uh, you know, went ahead and ratified the accounts, even though they were irregularities, and what Enron and the management was trying to do was hide its step in order to shore up its profitability and obviously keep the running uh, of the company afloat. And that, you know, was what is called a reactive approach because it was too late when the scandal came out. Obviously, the company, you know, collapsed and obviously a lot of investors and, you know, banking institutions and everybody, you know, lost money in that company. So here, what has happened is bad practices which were endorsed and, uh, you know, basically uh, the accounting firms went along with it. The audits were not that stringent. And what led this debacle happening in terms of the company folding and a lot of investors losing money is what is seen as a bit of a reactive approach. And a proactive approach in this case would be when a company looks at applying the triple bottom line concept just as a case in point. You look at people, profit, and planet. You look at uh, are the profits being made ethically? Is the company environmentally, uh, you know, um, uh, is the company holding upholding its responsibilities towards the environment? If it's specifically, you know, providing services or manufacturing or in engineering sector, looking at using, you know, raw materials or looking at outsourced services, are they paying the contractors enough and things like that? So those practices have to be looked at, and that is where, you know, again, this is a moral standard. This is not enforceable by law. But what we look at is the case in point of when we talk about the accountancy profession, we look at what is a reactive approach and when we look at a proactive approach. One of the examples that I will give you when the profession is that if you have a lot of clients and a client's business is doing quite well, at some stage what you know you would do as a proactive approach would be to start uh, giving your client information about the profit the company is making how these profits could be, you know, um, say invested, say, for example, uh, you know, looking at giving them some sort of an idea in terms of what could be the out, uh, outlay of the tax liability this year in terms of corporation tax. If the company is using, um, you know, bank order or has a lot of interest payments which are going in, then at some stage, you know, some forecasted, forecasted cash flow statements which are drawn up by the uh, agency or by the accountancy firm, try and give that information off to the client uh, before and before it becomes unmanageable. So those would be examples of, you know, uh, broad examples, I would say, of proactive approach. Sometimes you would see with smaller clients, you have this conversation monthly, quarterly, saying, that, okay, how business is doing well, you know, there's a lot of profits being made. How do we look at, you know, these services? How do we look at you know, say minimizing, uh, uh, say, for example, payments which are happening for banking costs or interest costs which are being paid on overdrafts and things like that. These kind of conversations which happen before your accounts are finalized at the end of the year would be seen as what are called proactive approach. Now, at the end of the year, if the business is done quite well and, you know, there's a big liability which is coming on corporation tax, but there are not enough cash flows to be able to pay that tax liability even though after filing in the tax, uh, you know, and uh, doing the accounts for the company for the year, you have three months, six months, nine months to be able to pay. Like in the case of COVID-19 pandemic, you know, government has delayed all what uh, payments uh, from the businesses to be collected for VAT and, you know, for corporation tax, there's been a relaxation given to be able to file them. But if this is something which the client does not realize in the, uh, you know, as a firm, as an accountant, you have not had that conversation with a client and has not been, they have not been informed on time, and when it comes to actually paying it and there's not enough money in the bank or, you know, you're having to resort to paying that in installments with interest being accumulating on the corporation tax would actually be showing a reactive approach in practical sense. Now, when we talk about one particular term, public interest, you know, when, when we talk about the Freedom of Information Act, how many of you know about or have heard about the Freedom of Information Act? Have you heard about the Freedom of Information Act of 2010? 
Now, okay. Sometimes would, this is something which was created in, you know, in the this was an act which was passed in Parliament in year 2000. And what Freedom of Information Act basically allowed is that when we look at uh, public companies, when we look at public sector enterprises, and when we look at information that needs to be seeked, uh, because obviously these are, um, you know, let's say, uh, organizations which work within the public sector and the government is the main beneficiary or the funder for these organizations. So you look at the NHS, for example, you look at BBC, for example. Now, if you have to get access to information, you know, there was no previously, prior to 2000, there was no way to be, be able to access information from these uh, large public sector enterprises, um, you know, uh, or through a formal means. But when this Freedom of Information Act was introduced, uh, you know, in 2000, it basically allows public to have a right of access to information which is held by public authorities. So it, this is this act allows the uh, public, members of public, to get access to the uh, you know information uh, from these companies or these public sector enterprises. And this is normally done under the request for Freedom of Information Act. Now, when we look look at uh, you know from an accounting point of view. When we look at, uh, you know, information being provided in the interest of, say, um, you know, information which is being provided freely. Now, if I look at, um, let's say, a practical example that I want to give is, um, if you look at Companies House, you know, maybe three, four, five years back, um, I think about three or four years back, you know, when companies filed the account, what we had to do, is we had to go across to some of the private registered companies to be able to buy information off for a particular company if you wanted to get hold of, say, uh, you know, the shareholding or, for example, the accounts or, you know, uh, any sort of, you know, reservations or any, uh, you know, minutes which have been passed or done, you know, for a particular company. Now, all this information currently is available at the company's house free of cost. So all I have to do is get into my company's house website, find the information about the company, and there I could see the abbreviated, non-abbreviated or, you know, uh, abbreviated accounts actually of any company because that is something which is now published online absolutely free of cost and it is available in the public domain. Now, the reason why this has been done is that the government has defined that or they have decided that, you know, there is some information which has to be made available in the in this particular case under the Freedom of Information Act in the interest of having that information available to the members of public, which basically allows the members of public to have certain, you know, or demand certain accountability from firms. Now, when you look at any business, uh, you know, if you see they are, all, they are required to file, uh, you know, their financial statements at the end of the uh, financial year, whichever that may be, or whatever that time frame may be. Now, those set of uh, accounts or the financial transactions of the business are then available to the members of and this is being made available by the company's house, uh, you know, or the, when you go to their website. And this is being allowed and made available as a part of that information under what is called public interest. So when we making that available for public interest means that some part of this information that you compile, generate, and publish has to be done in such a way that it basically is then easily accessible and easily understandable by members of public. So you, you're not, you know, some of the standards that we apply, the IEA standards that we apply in terms of producing some of these financial statements and accounts are created because what we want to be able to do is the interpretation of these statements which are produced should be easily possible for the members of public to be able to do. That means they should be complying with certain basic norms, but at the same time, they should be easy enough for the members of public to be able to understand what they actually mean. So when we look at the, um, you know, the accounting profession in general, and when we look at production of these statements and other details which are put out, uh, giving information about the financial side of things for an organization, they have to be done in such a way that they have to be in the, uh, you know, remit of what is called public interest. That means public should be able to derive meaningful information from this, and that information should not be something which should be, uh, you know, um, uh, conceived in a way wherein it is hidden, but that should be 
easily accessible and provide uh, you know provides the uh, and it should be easily de de you know decryptable that means members of public should be able to understand that information you know very clearly and that is why what we do see now from the last couple of years is that company house is now able to publish they will you know digitize all records if you file accounts for a particular company send it by registered post to company's house at cardiff in a couple of days you would see that that scanned version of the accounts which have been filed or whatever it is which have been sent across are now then published on company's house website and that is being done in uh, in the interest of what is called public so that this information is available to public, uh, you know, and then if the public wants to hold the directors of that company or the company accountable, some part of this information, which is the abbreviated accounts, are available uh, in the interest, uh, you know, freely uh, and uh, available to the members of public. So in general, when we look at the accounting profession and the approaches and obviously the publishing of financial information, some part of this is to be done in the um, in in the case uh, you know in the case of what is I would say public interest because you want the companies and the directors or the board uh, you know members of the company shareholders of the company to be held accountable and that information is released through the company's house in uh, the you know public interest and it is made available you know free of cost you don't need to pay for this information some part of this is available absolutely free of cost. If you want to keep a track of certain company activities, all you can do is go onto the company's house website, create your login, and then you can track a company uh, alerts. You could, uh, you know, sign up for alerts. So if a company's uh, documentation is filed on company's house, you'll get an alert or you'll get a message or an email to say, okay, this company has an account, this company has, you know, filed this resolution or this particular attendant or this particular update has come in and that is available to you, uh, you know, free of cost. In the interest, uh, in in the public's interest, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the third assessment criteria uh, quite quickly, which is looking at um, understanding some of the offences and penalties which apply when we talk about money laundering. Now, money laundering, uh, you know, when we talk about money laundering in general, we basically look at you know a couple of things. So in terms of how do we define money laundering? It's a process through which you know proceeds of time and the true ownership of what these proceeds actually provide can uh, you know when when we look at making these proceeds legitimate on paper. So, for example, if you have received money in cash and a lot lot of money is being received in cash and you're trying to basically regularize this through the accounting process or through the route of accounting, then some part of this could be termed as money laundering. There was a case which was I don't know how many of you remember. But there was a news and a case which is now recently got resolved uh, when a company in Bradford, which was basically a jeweler's company, they were depositing large sums of money in cash into the NatWest branch account, uh, you know, in Bradford. And after a five-year ruling, uh, you know, the, the company obviously and the directors of the company and the bank are under serious investigation that, uh, you know, money to the tune of, uh, you know, I think, if I remember correctly, 180 million pounds have been filed in cash at the bank, and the bank did not even raise any alarms of the bank manager or the bank authorities. And you know, in general, NatWest was not able to raise an alarm that this amount of money has been transacted or banked by this particular firm uh, in a span of over three and a half years. So when we look at large sums of money which are being regularized through the transactions. Uh, either through the banking route or through the you know publishing of these financial statements or accounts which are done year on year for the company would essentially account for what is called money laundering. Now there was an act which was created, which was called the POC Act, POCA Act of 2002, which is Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, and this basically you know is directly related to what is called money laundering and money laundering offences. Now, money laundering is basically dealing with things like concealing, disguising, converting, transferring, or removing, you know, uh, assets of the company or utilizing them for the benefit of, uh, you know, individual or other companies um, on the pretext of, uh, you know, say, for example, gains for the company in those cases will all be considered what are called under money laundering offenses. And in this case, any such money or you know money is being utilized to buy properties or invest in overseas investments or in general you know look at 
um, let's say, uh, activities which are done primarily to evade tax, which could be, say, setting up a pension fund, transferring it to another company, or giving it as a uh, as a director's loan account. You know, when we generally get to see and deal with this, would all be considered under what are called money laundering offenses. Now, when we talk about money laundering offenses, we also look at, you know, what is this act? How does it affect the directors of the company? What sections of the company, company's act it, uh, you know, needs to conform with? And why do we say that these are essentially, uh, you know, uh, considered offenses which would fall under money laundering? So anything which could lead to, uh, say, for example, in some cases, what we also see is proceeds of this money, uh, you know, uh, being given off to, say, donations to political parties, funding activities of terror, looking at property uh, investments and, you know, overseas uh, investment funds which are being created to buy large, uh, you know, um, let's say, um, properties or investments which are done in firms overseas. And this is primarily done from a point of view of evading taxes. This would all constitute what is called money laundering. Now, there are different sections under the Companies Act, which directly relate to money laundering, and they are specified here. So Section 327 is concealing, disguising, taking part in arrangement to facilitate acquisition or use of a control or property is under Section 328, and then acquiring or using, uh, uh, possessing a criminal property is under Section 329. Now, these sections, and, you know, when we look at when you when we deal with clients, for example, and when we know that uh, these offenses are being committed now as an accounting uh, as an accountant or as a person working within this profession under the code of ethics, we are supposed to be able to do and report these uh, you know uh, happenings or crimes which which could become crimes at some stage, and that is a part and parcel of our code of conduct or you know the professional ethics which we are required to adhere to now if you are uh, let's say, um, so when we talk about money laundering, what we want people to understand is what is the offenses and penalties. So offenses and penalties, if you're convicted for money laundering, there's a prison sentence for maximum of 14 years. So evasion of VAT, for example, a lot of companies which try and evade VAT, corporation tax, you're looking at, you know, investments being done to evade tax, essentially, some part of this can also be, you know, covered under what is called money laundering, and there are various sections for it. So when you look at if you're if the client is convicted for money laundering, then the maximum jail sentence is 14 years. If you're tipping off, that means you're basically aware of that this is a crime or this is being done for this particular reason, and you tip them, tip the various authorities off, and you are doing it as an informer, then obviously you don't get any imprisonment. But if you've been a part of that, and then also the tipping off has happened and the investigation has happened and led to the conviction, then in that case, the maximum sentence is five years. And if you fail to disclose or you have knowledge about it and you were suspicious about it, but you did not disclose, and this is negligence here saying that, oh, I wasn't very concerned about it or this was not a direct part of my role. But if that has been done and that failure has led to you know, the offense like money laundering happening, then also it is punishable by law. And, uh, you know, you could be fi imprisoned for about five years. Now, when we talk about uh, money laundering, we are also looking at some of these things, uh, you know, in terms of uh, sometimes when you become an informer and you're, you know, you're wanting to basically inform the relevant authorities, then in those cases, when you do a required disclosure, then in some cases, you have to disclose who's the suspect or what information you have. And in some cases, you know, whereabouts is this money being laundered? Is it being done in property, in crime, in overseas investment, in evasion of tax? And that allows the authorities under the Offenses Act of uh, 2002, you know, which is the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, to take relevant action. And then individuals, when, when, the, when the action is taken, the individuals then can be or a hefty fines can be levied, you know, in order to, um, you know, deter these acts from happening again. So as of now, if you see the official statement which NatWest Bank has released, you know, for the, um, you know, money laundering which was happening, uh, you know, in Bradford with this uh, jeweler, you know, what, what they have done is the, they have said that they will cooperate, uh, you know, fully uh, with this particular investigation 
and uh, if they are found to be liable, as you can see, this is the piece of news item, Bradford Jeweler linked to NatWest money laundering charge. Now, if the bank is for, for found liable that they have not been able to discharge their duties uh, and they have been found that they have been negligent in discharge of their duties, what you will generally see is that the bank will also receive fines and they will be under this particular Money Laundering Act or you know the Penalties of Crime Act 2002. So this particular news is very recent, 21st of March, as you can see, and uh, you know it is something which is predominantly related to a jeweler depositing large amounts of money which has been deposited in NatWest Bank over a period of three years, amounting to 180 uh, million. So the Financial Conduct Authority is doing a thorough investigation and if the bank is found that they have not been able to discharge their, discharge their duty, uh, duties towards this, then they will be fined uh, in, 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 the, in this case because of the, um, uh, the POCA uh, 2002 Act. Now, in general, we also want to quickly understand what does fraud and fraudulent behavior consist of. So as, uh, you know, somebody working within this profession, we want to be able to understand, you know, where all frauds can happen. So frauds can happen predominantly when you're looking at insider dealing, which I give you an example of. If you're an employee, you, you have shareholdings, or if you're dealing as a broker uh, with shares of employees of a particular company, and you know that the company share value going up and down and you're dealing and selling them off, you know, before you, uh, because you have access to that information would be an example of what is called the insider dealing. Money laundering, as I've explained, bribery we have understood, and then fraudulent and wrongful trading in some cases, you know, if uh, you are basically using forged documents or putting out information which is inaccurate uh, and not true and using those, uh, using that information to basically do uh, trading or, you know, gains which can be done or received from wrongful trading would also be covered under what is called, you know, fraudulent behavior. And these are all part and parcel of what are called criminal offenses. So when we talk about, going back to when I mentioned initially that this particular learning outcome is all about understanding laws, acts, and regulations, and which part of the law, which is criminal law, is the branch that we would generally be looking at dealing with when we talk about some of the offenses and the fraudulent behavior which tends to happen, the dealing with financial side of things, and that could be bribery, it could be, you know, looking at things like money laundering, and they will all come under what is called the fraudulent behavior. Now, a couple of things which I want to look at. One is fraud can also be con uh, conducted under a business name. You could form a company, that company might be dealing with, uh, you know, or dealing with the activities which are considered fraudulent. And in those cases, if that is to be found that the companies are in breach of or the company's directors are in breach of, you know, certain guidelines which have been set uh, under the Section 82 of Companies Act of 2006, then you would also look at, you know, the, comp the business actually falling in breach of these guidelines. Now, if the company's directors are doing it and they are convicted, then under the company's Directors Disqualification Act, CDDA, this act then would disbar uh, or basically, you know, um, not, you know, you could have fines which are, um, uh, you know, imposed on the director of the company. You could also be debarred from becoming a director for three years, 10 years, 15 years. And this is all covered under what is called the company's uh, Directors Disqualification Act or CDDA Act of you know, 1986. So when we talk about the EOA and MOA, and in some cases, if these responsibilities which are, uh, you know, defined when the company is formed, and if you are the director of that company, and if uh, in some cases these duties are not discharged in the rightful manner, then you can also be imprisoned for two years. You could be having, uh, you know, fines. And in some cases, you could be debarred from being a director of a company or becoming a director of a company for a period of three years, and in some cases, also five years. Now, there is a term called Phoenix Companies. Have you heard about the term called Phoenix Companies? Mm, Any idea wow. about Phoenix Companies? No. Okay. No. When, when we talk about Phoenix Companies, you know, there is this particular section 216, 217, which is under the Invo Insolvency Act of, uh, you know, uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 1986. And when we say Phoenix companies, what we mean by that is that, you know, these are companies which essentially, you know, um, um, let's say 
um, they are used to basically describe or they carry out practices uh, on, you know, carry practices on same same name uh, of some of the businesses. And what the, we are able to see is that these companies are opened by a number of you might, you might be a director in a company and you open a number of companies. And the idea there is that you're trying to open a number of companies wherein you transfer the liability of one company to another company, dissolve it or liquidate it, then transfer the liability of another company. And in such cases, when you see a series of such companies becoming insolvent or going into liquidation at any given point in time within a 12-month accounting period, and if the directors of the company or the shadow directors of the company are the same, then in this case, what is um, this is particularly concerned under what is called the Insolvency Act of 1986, wherein what tends to happen is that if this is if the company is to go into liquidation and a series of such companies go into liquidation and has a common ownership or a director, then in those cases the director becomes liable for the uh, you know debts or the owings or the borrowings which the company has, and in such cases this is considered a criminal offence. Now. Generally speaking, you could be a director of many companies uh, and there is no such restriction. Even, um, you know, companies formed in the UK, you could be an overseas person and still be holding a directorship in the company. That is allowed under the Companies Act of 2006. But if the provision of becoming a director and you're, you know, opening companies from a point of view of putting them to liquidation for participation, for creating fraud, and if the individual or the ownership in this case is with one particular person, then, and if these companies are dissolved within a 12-month period, one after the other, and you see a series of such companies being dissolved or liquidated or becoming insolvent, which can't pay their debt, then in this case, the director of that company becomes liable to be able to settle those debts, and these companies which are formed with that intention would be called, what are called Phoenix companies. So, there is this particular uh, term which had come about, which is a company which is formed when the assets of the company becomes insolvent and the company's directors actually purchase those would be to look at dealing with the debts or disposal of the assets of that company. And in those cases, those companies are called Phoenix companies. So as accountants or people working in this profession, we need to be aware that a company which primarily gets formed from a point of view of defrauding looking at dealing with the liquidation of assets and has the same director and the process is becoming, uh, you know, and this is a thing that you get to see wherein a series of companies owned by that person has been put into liquidation, gone into administration or have become insolvent, then they are covered under what is called the, uh, you know, Companies Act, uh, Insolvency Act of 1986 and sections 216 and 217 apply. So this is something that we need to be aware of when we talk about, you know, uh, this particular learning outcome wherein we generally see and talk about malpractice. So this is an example of malpractice. Fraud, bribery, uh, we talk about uh, corruption, and we talk about, you know, um, uh, fraud being committed uh, on the pretext of being negligent. And this will allow us to cover, you know, this particular um, learning out, uh, sorry, assessment criteria. So any questions on this? No. Okay, let's look at the uh, last assessment criteria when we want to look at understanding, you know, the major acts that we w want to understand from the point of view of the learning outcome. And they tend to be, you know, these major acts that we are going to look at. So we are going to look at basically having an understanding on how these acts and legislations apply uh, from our point of view of, uh, you know, accounting profession. So the first one that we're going to look at is primarily the Computer Misuse Act. So this particular act was introduced in 1990. Uh, basically, there could be lots of offenses which could be committed under this particular act, but uh, the essence of this act is, or the legislation is that there are people, if you get involved in assessing, modifying data which is stored on a computer without the permission of the individual or the, intent, uh, in the, the person who uses it, then in those cases, you're going to be committing an offense and that will be covered under what is called the Computer Misuse Act. Now, these offenses could be your unauthorized uh, access to a computer material. You could be using it uh, from a point of view of unauthorized access to facilitate uh, or gaining information. And in some cases, you know, this, these could be acts which are done with the intent to impair or, you know, like when we say 
uh, if, uh, you know, the website has been brought down by uh, excessive, you know, um, let's say traffic or bots using the computer to infect the virus so that the information on the computer could be destroyed or, you know, uh, could not be recoverable. So those are acts which are all covered under, you know, the Offenses uh, Act of uh, the Computer Misuse Offense Act or Act of 1990. Now, the second one that we look at in particular is uh, the Bribery Act. Now, the Bribery Act of 2010 essentially, uh, you know, covers when a person offers, gives, promises, uh, to give financial or other advantage to another individual in exchange for improperly performing a relevant function or activity. So bribing can be done in the form of what is called contracts, non-monetary gifts, or even offers of employment. So anything which is done in order to gain a financial advantage, which could be done through the route of contracts, offering non-monetary gifts, which are hospitality gifts or excessive hospitality, and even in some cases offers of employment, would all be considered or covered under what is called the Bribery Act of 2010. Now, there are obviously some details which have been explained, but going to cover just generally the third act, which is primarily looking at, you know, Data Information Act or the Data Protection Act of 1998 and now revised, you know, to the GD with the GDPR guidelines. We'll look at that in a second. Let me just have a quick look in terms of um what i would want to cover also apart from this yeah so we are looking at the next which is the fraud act of 2006 so this is related to any um you know activities which are done from a point of view of criminal activities the fraud act of 2006 covers that and obviously uh, this act basically looks at if you're trying to obtain property by deception money transfer by deception obtaining a, a pecuniary advantage by deception, which means, you know, anything related to money or money-related money, money related transactions or obtaining services by deception. One of the things when you see the Fraud Act of 2006 implemented, to give an example, sometimes you would see when you're seeking information from the bank or if you've gone to the bank and you're transferring land sums or money, one of the things that we get to see this happening is as an in the accounting profession is if your client is taking out a mortgage, if your client is looking at transferring money for certain services to you know a third party like a solicitor, you generally see that there is an applicability of what is called a client account, when the money is ring fenced and this is to be used only for those services for which the client is actually transferring you the money and that you are going to withhold it and then transfer it at some point in time on behalf of the client to the beneficiary because those services have been then provided to your client. So when we look at the Fraud Act and when such uh, when such dealings are happening wherein you're transferring money to a client account, you would normally see that some of these terms and conditions are read out to you if you're doing that electronic transfer or if you go into a branch and you make that transfer when it's done for a mortgage, you see that there are some guidelines which are read out to you that are you transferring this money on on behalf of this or you know are you under any pressure to transfer this money as any members of the public police or you know any other department asked you to transfer this money so those are bits which were in the in the uh, you know the bank in this case the person that you're dealing with in the bank is going through and these are basically going through the terms and conditions of the fraud act 2006 so are you obtaining property by deception if you're transferring money for a mortgage if you're uh, transferring money to a client account for certain services, they would normally ask, and if this money is in excess of 10,000 pounds, then these kind of terms and conditions are going to be read out. And these are all covered under what are called the Fraud uh, Act of 2006. Now, the reason why this comes into play is because um, when, we, when you look at, you know, providing some of these services and as an accountant, or if you're dealing on behalf of your client wherein you have the authority to be able to deal on behalf of your client, then the idea would be that when you act and transfer this money or uh, are dealing with funds and transference of money, then your main goal is to remain unbiased. Your main goal is to ensure that there is no conflict of interest and there is no undue influence which this transaction or this transaction or transfer of money is causing uh, in terms of providing undue influence to others. So in those cases, 
as a as an accountant as a person working within the sector you have to have and maintain independence or a professional distance when you're dealing on behalf of your clients in such transactions and these transactions are then covered under what are called the frauds act of you know 2006 now when we talked about um when when we talk about you know crimes or misuse which can be done we also look at something called the financial interest now in some cases sometimes as accountants we would deal with our clients uh, you know from a point of view when we talk about financial interest it could be defined as shares equity you know pension schemes dependents loans overdraft like lot of accountants have offered services to their clients to look at doing what is called the bounce back loans uh, you know applications you look at for example the um uh, what is this called the furlough scheme a lot of accountants have you know obviously charged their clients to you know make applications or do the processing of the furlough scheme now in such cases when you are actually dealing with um you know dealing on behalf of your client but if there is a financial vested financial interest which comes in then in this case whether it's direct or indirect financial interest which comes in wherein you're receiving in exchange for these services certain fees or value and as long as they've been declared that is absolutely fine but if this is being done like in some cases uh, the um, the not the website has started to now publish names of companies from january onwards which are claiming furlough or the jobs uh, you know job support scheme uh, as it is now called from the government so they publish the name of the companies now in some cases if accountants are dealing on behalf of these clients or the companies in order to file for the bounce back loan applications or you know any such sort of say furlough schemes and if you are receiving some financial uh, you know say advantage or in uh, you know getting some financial reward in return then in those cases this would also you know uh conflict with your responsibilities of working as an accountant because in this case there is some sort of a financial interest or gain that you are getting on 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 processing of these claims on behalf of your client as long as they are within a certain uh, boundary wherein they have been defined you are raising an invoice and they have been done ethically then they would be okay but in some cases if it is being done from a point of view of uh, you know frauding defrauding or basically looking at gaining financially for a client even though they are not applicable or these can, things would not be applicable to the clients then would be considered under what is called you know misrepresentation of facts and that is where you know the fraud act of 2006 would also come into play in and this could also have another connotation wherein you might not be gaining monetarily but you know your client might be giving you off gifts or hospitality or inducements and these would essentially be uh, because you're receiving them in order to have these claims processed on behalf of your clients and again this will relate to what is called the maintaining of professional independence when you work as an accountant or when you provide these services and that is what is required also under the code of practice and ethical guidelines uh, you know for us when when we look at the various bodies specifically defining that now last but not the least when we talk about you know um so client monies was essentially looking at you know the client account money or uh, payments that you normally get and you are making on behalf of your clients it could be either corporation tax refunds that you get refund receipts that you get primarily you know which are coming across if uh, claims for tax or corporation tax have been filed and the checks come back to the accountant then obviously in those cases you know under the uh, obviously under under the uh, you know maintaining of professional uh, independence these are remitted back to the client or the company and not kept by the accountants are bits and pieces which are covered under you know um, the the basic parts of uh, professional ethics and standards which you are expected to maintain then we talk about the last act that we want to discuss in today's um, you know assessment criteria the last one 3.4 is the data protection act now in most companies it is a legal requirement to have an ico certificate from the information commissioner's office if you deal and have information about you know of your clients wherein you have information sensitive information about things like passport uh, you know financial information or information that is related to a particular individual from their point of view of their demographics or you know their personal information then as an organization you are required to have an ico certificate 
uh, in the organization, there needs to be a data protection officer. There needs to be levels of uh, access to that information which have to be clearly defined so that you know this information does not fall into the wrong hands and should not fall into the wrong hands for the use of fraudulent purposes. Uh, you know, in the cases of you know, for example, identity or the documents being forged or stolen to gain financial benefits. And in these cases, what we look at is we refer to what is called the Data Protection Act of 1998 and now 2016, which covers the Journal Data Protection Regulation Guidelines. And this is where you have to maintain confidentiality. You have to discuss the uh, accounts or the dealing of those accounts or uh, you know statements can only be done with the authorized person. Uh, who's authorized on your behalf to deal with and also from a client side and these cannot be di disclosed or diverged to any other third party without the knowledge of your client. So these are all things which are covered under the Data Protection Act and this is what we need to cover predominantly when we look at, you know, our duties uh, from a point of view of, uh, from, from a point of view of the accounting profession in general that we need to be able to maintain confidential information uh, that information needs to be under, uh, you know, strict control in terms of levels of access. If that information has to be shared with other people working within your own organization, then levels of access have to be defined. A data protection officer has to uh, be put in place. So if the websites, for example, collect information, uh, you know, when, when a cookie and, you know, sometimes now it's a legal, it's a legal requirement, not sometimes it's a legal requirement now in Europe that all websites have to ask for information to be stored and that is where you know you look at they normally say what information minimum information you want the website to uh, store about you and if somebody writes to the data protection officer in the organization and asks for what information is stored from the website or you have on file then the dpo has the responsibility to be able to revert back to that uh, you know, customer who's seeking that information and if they say that that information needs to be removed or they request for the removal of that information, then that has to be complied for and, and all that is covered under what is called the Data Protection Act uh, and the ICO guidelines, which are a part and parcel of this when we deal with clients and we have access to their sensitive information, which is stored within our offices, whether electronically or on paper, we need to have the ICO certificate and we need to be able to understand these data protection guidelines to be able to ensure that no uh, fraudulent activity can take place or theft of identity cannot happen uh, while you have this sensitive information on your premises or uh, within your PCs and servers. So that helps us cover, you know, this particular, um, you know, assessment criteria, which is what are the offenses and penalties which can be applied when we talk about these four broad acts that we want to cover, which is the Computer Misuse Act, the the Penalties and Computer Misuse Act or POCA of 2002, the Fraud Act of 2006, and the Data Protection Act uh, of 1998 and 2016. So any questions on this? No, I don't it. Right, so here, though we have covered this learning outcome, this learning outcome in general is about, you know, understanding the implication of law and where it applies in the accounting profession. So in each assessment criteria, we've understood broadly the, uh, you know, the, uh, the area of law, we've understood where it applies, and then we have related it to the accounting profession, because that is the task that we need to do. We don't need to study law. We need to understand what part of it applies to our profession, to our services that we provide, and in general, what are the standards and code of ethics that we need to conform to while we are basically dealing and providing with these services? That's the essence of this particular learning outcome. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So I'll catch up with you next week to cover the learning outcome for a copy of this updated presentation. And obviously, the recording will go up today later on the site. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. Um, at Raman at UKversary. There are lots of uh, small handouts which I'm going to be uploading on uh, Moodle, which will cover and give you information about, you know, the various acts in particular, uh, which we need to be aware of. There are one or two pages that you can read through and they'll give you detailed information about the Bribery Act, the Fraud, Fraud Act, uh, the Data Protection Act, and in general, the Computer Misuse Act. Just to familiarize yourself from a point of view of, you know, 
um, theoretical aspects of it. But in terms of where they apply, how they apply and relate to our services and our profession, those are the ones that we need to understand and those are ones which we have described you know, in the slides for you to be able to study. Yeah. So thanks so much for joining. And uh, what I will do is uh, catch up.